How do you keep your human population so well under heel? He has them kill each other. Well, that's what I would do. Humans clearly have the numbers. So fear is essential. And getting them to do it, that is the trick. Ritualization helps make it sort of a game. It's all very efficient, really. <laughs> At least in my experience. It seems we have similar minds. It has done wonders, tamping down the human's more rebellious impulses. <laughs> My name is Dan Willis. I was in the United States Navy. I held a top secret crypto level 14 extra sensitive material handling security clearance. I worked in the code room at the Naval Communication Station in San Francisco. In 1969, I received a priority message from a ship near Alaska that uh, was classified as secret. The ship reported uh, merging out of the ocean near Port Bow, a brightly glowing uh, reddish-orange elliptical object, approximately 70 feet in diameter, emerged out of the water, <coughs> shot into space, traveling at about 7,000 miles per hour. This was uh, tracked on ship's radar and substantiated. Years later, I worked at the Naval Electronic Engineering Center in San Diego for 13 years. A co-worker who I worked with worked at the NORAD facility. When he first started working at the facility, he noticed objects going on the screens that track everything out in space and in the air. Objects going off the scale, doing right angle turns. When he inquired, his older supervisor advised him that, uh, quote, it was just a visit from one of our little friends. Uh, these statements are true and willing to testify under oath before Congress. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joe Chin from Ghost Hunters and their former Ghost Hunters International. You're listening to Conspiracy, Fact or Theory with Stephen Crawford. Dan Willis, how are you doing today, Dan? Hey, good to be on your show, Stephen. Uh, yeah, hey, we keep seeding it out there, don't we? We do, and uh, I've been seeing your face all over the internet for years. Decided to check out your video. I was like, oh man, this guy seems pretty cool. I've got to talk to him. So that's why uh, I did the little reach out, and it was very cool of you to get back to me. So thank you for that. Well, pretty much a hermit up here on the mountains, living off grid. But uh, you know, I, I feel like I got a little bit of a ticket being one of the top secret witnesses that testified in Washington 17 years ago. So um, I feel like uh, you know it, the whole situation got sanitized by the controlled mainstream media, mockingbird as they call it. Uh, right. So it's good to uh, good to use alternative channels as much as we can. Actually, I wanted to ask you, how did you get in touch with Dr. Greer in the beginning, and how did Dr. Greer get into this in the first place, if you know? Good questions. Well, why the National Press Club happened, this uh, winded back a little bit f first, uh, was that our legal constitutional government basically got infiltrated. Uh, was an agreement that happened during the Eisenhower administration back in 1955. And it goes into a long history. You know, Eisenhower was denied access, especially when MJ-12 operations um, and CIA operations were moved from Wright-Patterson over to Area 51 S4, and then he was denied access to that. He relayed all this to Kennedy 10 days before uh, his assassination. He attempted to get into the files, and he was denied access. Uh, Carter was trying to get, President Carter was trying to get an access. He was denied by Bush Sr. Yes, that uh, in itself it goes is along pretty messed up. To, uh, 93 when uh, one of the Rockefeller bro brothers uh, 
Lawrence Rockefeller wanted to have a disclosure, which is kind of unusual for Rockefellers. Um, and so uh, Clinton had a CIA director, James Woolsey, attempt to get access. He was denied access. The CIA director is being denied access. Um, and so they brought Dr. Greer into a meeting since he couldn't go through regular military channels and, uh, and intelligence channels. And he said, he brought a huge stack of documents proving it, said, I know the subject's real, I'm trying to figure out why the hell I can't gain access to it. Um, it was, uh, it was in 1997 that Dr. Greer with the astronaut Edgar Mitchell went to the Pentagon and met with the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Admiral Tom Wilson, who was uh, shown a list of unacknowledged special access programs. And uh, he was denied access. The head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was <laughs> denied access. He was okay. not in the need to know. Uh, so, so he told them that, he said, quote, if you can get your people together and go before the media, you have my permission. This group is illegal, quote, unquote. You know, so you know, we, had, we had technologies to get off of nuclear oil and coal for many, many decades. President, CIA directors are being denied access. Bases are visually witnessed on the other side of the moon. The astronauts are told to keep quiet what happened. Uh, 57 different species have already been categorized by 1989. Uh, nukes being shut down. Um, you know, on and on. Uh, any, any one of these testimonies, if it got out to the public, would have uh, been a world-changing event. But what happened was um, the uh, mainstream media, like CNN and all the rest of them, you are they fake sanitized news. the event in what's called a, they call it a limited hangout. In other words, all this explosive testimony, these witnesses breaking national security oaths, uh, they, uh, they said, oh, the disclosure project's looking to aliens, you know, to solve the world's energy problems, and, and that we are not alone, and, uh, you know, this type of thing, just to, to downplay the whole thing. And no congressional hearings are planned right now, which means they're never going to be planned. We are not alone. That's the message a group of pilots, scientists, and former government officials want Congress to hear. Ken Shotnick shows us tonight what some people are calling a UFO cover-up. I've never seen it. Look at that. I don't know, but I got it on tape. A strand of moving light in the sky over Phoenix. A bright glowing streak dashing through West Covina. What looks like a flying saucer tracked on radar over Mexico City. Are these UFOs caught on tape? Dan Wills is a former radio operator for the Navy. I took personally communications from ships that uh, were reporting uh, the extraterrestrial craft merging out of the ocean and shooting off into space. He's among a group of scientists, military and former FAA officials calling for congressional hearings to establish the presence of UFOs and extraterrestrials. 21 members of that group already have testified in Washington for what's known as the Disclosure Project. Dr. Stephen Greer is the director of the Disclosure Project. He's gathered 400 witnesses who say it's time for government secrecy to end. We can establish through this testimony that these objects of extraterrestrial origin have been tracked on radar going thousands of miles per hour. It's come to a critical point where the truth needs to be revealed to the people. They believe a congressional hearing is the only way to set the record straight. The Disclosure Project has its work cut out for it because as of right now, no congressional hearings are planned. As far as the Bush administration goes, this is 17 years ago. Um, and how this whole infiltration happened was, it sounds like a crazy science fiction story. You know, you know when I, uh, Stephen, when I went to Washington back in May 9th, 2001, I thought you know, naively, this is going, I became aware of all the witness testimonies that I thought, no way uh, can this information get out and not be a world-changing event. I had no idea, and I, had, I couldn't even wrap my mind around the implications of all these testimonies of what they were saying. Good morning. My name is Carl Wolf, and I was a precision electronics photographic repairman with a top secret crypto clearance in the United States Air Force. I was stationed at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. 
1965, um, mm. in mid-1965, I was loaned to the Lunar Orbiter Project at NASA on Langley Field. I went to the facility, and when I walked into the facility, there were scientists from all over the world. I was stunned, actually, to see people at a NASA project uh, from all over the world. It didn't make any sense to me initially. About 30 minutes into the process, he said to me, um, in a very distressed way, um, by the way, we've discovered a base on the backside of the moon. And then he proceeded to put photographs down in front of me, and clearly in these photographs were structures, uh, mushroom-shaped buildings, spherical buildings, and towers. And at, at that point, I was very concerned because I knew we were working on compartmentalized security. He had breached security, and I was actually frightened at that moment. And I did not question him any further. And a few moments later, someone did come into the room. Um, I worked there for three more days, and I remember going home and naively thinking, I can't wait to hear about this on the evening news. <laughs> and here it is, more than 30 years later, and I hope we hear about it tonight. And I will testify under oath before Congress that what I'm saying is the truth. Eisenhower, it is <laughs> alleged that back in 53, I believe it was 53, he had met with aliens, but only after he had to threaten to bring in the army from Colorado after sending two of his agents out to find out what the heck was going on. So what do you know about that? Well, the restructure, it, it's really a key element that happened back there. It's actually around 1955. Um, what happened was, if you roll back the clock a little bit further, find out what happened with Eisenhower. Uh, way back with Nazi Germany, uh, Nazi Germany had figured out torsion physics and had anti-gravity craft by 1934. It wasn't until October of 1954 that the United States had developed uh, anti-gravity. Therefore, Nazi Germany had a technological advantage over uh, the United States. This is, was the, um, the flyover over the Capitol building in 1952, intimidating That's Truman and Eisenhower. That's what I thought. They yeah. didn't fire. They couldn't fire at that point, but they could fly. So they did a flyby just to... See, I'm getting goosebumps. Good call, my friend. No. Well, they... Uh, you know, Operation High Jump back in 1947, you know, Admiral which uh, they had to put James Forrestal away in the hospital to, uh, you know, uh, I was born one month after they threw him out of the window in 1949. Thank you for that. Um, I'm so glad you mentioned that. So, so <clears throat> yeah, what happened was Nazis couldn't compete against the industrial might of the United States. We could build 10 planes and tanks for every one the Nazis could produce. Uh, but the Nazis had way advanced te technology. Um, Kennedy went over there with James Forrestal and was back in 1945 and was reviewing all this stuff. And they were like, that's what kicked in Operation Paperclip because they realized that, God, these people are like way ahead of us. And so what happened was they, uh, you know, through the help of Alan Dulles and others, uh, they uh, effectively infiltrated. The Nazis had this plan called Balkenschallenskrieg, which means worldview warfare. They planned to infiltrate into the United States using uh, a matrix of perception. And they did effectively in 1940, uh, 1946. They rewrote the history, the Rockefeller Foundation, of what actually happened. They, didn't, they, they took out all the part about the Nazis escaped and, and the, the occult and, you know, all the connections with that. So we have the children in the future and the schools and everything are all being fed this false narrative that what happened at the end of World War II. Um, Who writes by history 19, but the victors? Yeah, yeah and by, uh, it was in 1950... Uh, you know, Alan Dulles started Operation Mockingbird, where they had 400 paid journalists that were giving out uh, information about the CIA. Today, we have guys called non-official journalists, which the CIA provides information to look like it's coming from independent sources. We have witnesses testifying to that. Alan Dulles was very instrumental in all this, you know, highly 
infiltrated the whole CIA operation, uh, bringing in uh, Nazi General Reinhard Gellin because they had, uh, you know, they had the intelligence on the Soviets, and there was a big fear at the time from the Truman administration of what the Soviets were going to do, and so they kind of used that as a playing card. They had this. Uh, all this uh, Soviet intelligence reports in these uh, little sealed containers hidden away in the Bavarian mountains that they brought out and shared. Anyway, they brought in thousands of Nazi spies into the CIA, mm-hmm. um, brought them into NASA. Uh, they started the Invention Secrecy Act, 1951. 1951, they also started Project Dove, which was infiltrating into Hollywood, started to control the movies, you know, starting with the day the Earth stood still, you know, and all the evil aliens movies we've seen. Um, let's see, you've got entertainment industry, you have science, you have education, we have the mainstream media. You know, they, basically they were able to create this matrix of perception and basically hoodwink generation after generation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we don't know. So uh, bottom line is uh, by uh, February 11th, 1955, Eisenhower was forced into an agreement. See, they moved all their operations down into Antarctica. The the uh, transnational corporations that went into essentially, you know, started the Nazis off in the beginning, you know. Oh, and they also infiltrated, uh, according to uh, insider William Tompkins, the the pharmaceutical industries of which they control the highest levels of that as well. So our health industry as well has been infiltrated. Uh, and so what happened was he was forced into an agreement that provided personnel, industrial might of the corporations, uh, to, and uh, essentially they were using slave labor. And so, um, you know, that's why we have an executive order recently done uh, December last year against people with human rights abuse and uh, corruption, you know, because of uh, all this going on. Eisenhower realized that in the future, this uh, cabal that's connected with the Nazis and the transnational corporations and the Nazis had, you know, developed a... um, a, uh, as uh, Professor Homer and Oberth stated, you know, they had help from people from other worlds, you know, in other words, they, there was a uh, extraterrestrial race which helped ge- leapfrog them into uh, the advanced technology that they had. Um, more on that a little bit later, but on Eisenhower, um, what happened was uh, Eisenhower realized that this, this group could completely take over in the future our constitutional republic. And so he set up a secret marine intelligence unit that would come active if uh, this group ever, you know, tried to complete, if the corruption got so bad that they had to take over in the future, this marine intelligence unit would come into play. And there was a little sign of that. that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Last year, yeah, thank God he did that. Uh, You know, because I didn't have any hope. You know, Stephen, when I, after I went to Washington, uh, I saw what CNN and you West Dublin did, news. and then, you know, CBS came, they did a special interview just with me, and I said before they flew down from L.A., I said, I'm not doing this interview unless I can say a little short sentence, you know, we have the scientists within these black projects and prove we have a solution, a non-polluting solution to get off of nuclear oil and coal. Uh, they promised up and down that I could say that. They interviewed me for 45 minutes. You are fake news. That's uh, actually, it's so 45 minutes, and what did they edit it down to? They edited it down to uh, basically did a cookie cutter exactly what CNN did was, uh, oh, we are not alone. We have hundreds of witnesses and things that want to have a congressional hearing on the reality of UFOs. And then the only thing I get to say is it's come to a critical point where the truth needs to be revealed to the people. The only trouble is that truth never got out, and the producer of the show, she was almost in tears. She said, I know I promised, but the higher executives made me cut that part out. And uh, one of the 21 witnesses that joined me, uh, the attorney uh, Daniel Sheehan, who 
testified about uh, Jimmy Carter being denied access by Bush Sr., he showed me a document listing 42 CIA NSA operatives that are in high media executive positions. You know, anybody who researches this subject matter knows that, that you know, the intelligence community completely controls the uh, the mainstream media, you know, through the you five corporations news. that are completely engineering our perceptions and our consent. We was Putin. I've been, you know, I'm not ashamed to admit I've been loving a lot of what Putin's been doing and saying, especially to corporation owners over in uh, in his own country. And he and he films it. He has national media there while he's calling these guys cockroaches. It's incredible. And and essentially, I, I I love that when he does that. Yeah, well, I've seen you know, those before. Yeah, he, I like it. And we have Trump doing the <laughs> same like thing, but politely. <laughs> like Trump's not p- calling people cockroaches. At least I wish he would, because some of them are. You know, and and what, especially when you get your fake CNN, and it just it, it must have been uh, disheartening for you. Uh, you you you're thinking you know I just got this job with ABC and then you get there and you realize man they're 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 panning everybody but we have to be willing to open our eyes and our minds to the ability that the government's doing this to us I mean it MK Ultra's a fact we know that it was in the papers uh, we know that Iraq didn't have weapons of mass destruction we know these things so why is it so hard to believe? That the government would be suppressing zero point energy and free energy and uh, electromagnetic propulsion units. My thought on you, what you were saying about the government, my, you know, there's, there's good people in our government, good people in our military, good people in our intelligence community. Uh, the thing is, you've got you've got two agendas going on. You have the white hats, black hats. You could say the you know the simplify things. Uh, and it seems like uh, that whole situation is coming about to a head right now. Uh, when you when you consider that, uh, <laughs> what was it uh, on the twenty first of December of last year uh, when Trump? See what the cabal does is they use the legal system, the legal framework, in order to set up things for their agenda. You know, such as the Patriot Act and the NDAA and other draconian uh, legal executive orders. Uh, when this executive order that basically freezes the assets of anybody doing human rights abuse or corruption, on the same exact day that that executive order was signed. General Mathis, you know, Secretary of Defense, flew down with a thousand Marines down to Guantanamo Bay with five hundred million dollars to expand the facilities. And today we have what over forty-five thousand sealed indictments. You know, it, it's sort of an indication that this uh, Marine intelligence. You, you look at Trump; he's surrounded by a lot of Navy and Marines. And he salutes uh, them. Do you notice that? He stops and shakes their hand, he salutes them, and he gets made fun of for that. It's it's insane. Alex Jones's advisor, you know, Dr. Jerome Corsi, said that, uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is true, and I have no way of substantiating it, but that before, they knew that See, in 1954, they set up the Bilderberg meeting by a former Nazi SS officer, you know, and every uh, every year they they meet together and they get the most influential people in finance and media and everything that can help push and move their agenda forward. And they also select the world leaders of the different countries who they're going to, you know, one way or another, they get those leaders in. And uh, this last election, it didn't work. And what happened was, uh, what happened was, uh, according to Dr. Jerome Corsi, is that they met with uh, Trump, the military that is, and they said they need to bring him in in order to take down this cabal that is infiltrated. So Eisenhower's oh. military got in touch with Trump. Is that what you're saying? A, um, a development of that of that agreement that was set up way back in 1955. Right. Yes, you could say that. And uh, and you got kind of a sign of that back in November of 2017 when the Marine Expeditionary Unit with several helicopters fully manned with troops was flying over the CIA headquarters for a full 30 minutes. 
I had not uh, heard about basically that. telling them to back off because they were supporting Obama's uh, policies of, of supplying the you know the Syrian freedom fighters with all those weapons and things, which was going all into the hands of ISIS and Al Qaeda, which was being used to kill our guys and the Marines. They're driving uh, around so in new yeah, Toyotas. They, they, they told them to back off. Yeah. <laughs> well, my prime minister is bringing them. See, so you guys, what what Trump needs to do, you do need a wall. But I don't think you need it in Mexico. I think you need it at our border, the Canadian border, because our prime minister is bringing all of ISIS in and he's made them millionaires. He's giving them all my, he's putting them up in hotels. You guys are so lucky to have Trump. Liberals want you guys to think we hate Trump. We don't. We, we love Trump. We, we know that all politicians are puppets. But Trump's against the grain because he has his own money. Because he's been to all the parties that both sides of these the aisle go to. When they were drunk, he heard all the secrets. When people are drunk, they talk. He knows all the secrets. And when he, that's why when he was running for office, they were losing their shit. Hillary was saying, if he makes it into office, we're all going to hang. And that's because he knew all the secrets. And they, you're, you're, a lot of your citizens, the Democratic side, have just been so programmed against Trump that they don't even, everything else is off the table, whether whether it's space travel or health care or education, there just seems to be this liberal democratic dementia that is taking over and stopping anything from getting done. I'm sure you've noticed it. Yeah, it's the, uh, the mockingbird media, you could say, that uh, has pitting pitting people against each other, you have to understand that the CIA, the intelligence community, is a well-known fact that they control this. They tied into billions of dollars of think tanks that have it down to a polished T, you know, the psychological engineering. What news shows, you know, what news coverage they cover, what words, what inflections, the, the whole science of engineering our perceptions to, in order to, this is what's been used to pit us against each other. As long as we're fighting each other, we don't know who the, the hidden hand, who the real enemy is that's been psychologically uh, engineering us. That's why I will feel a great joy and relief when the United States Marine Corps comes in and uh, takes over CNN. You know, <laughs> you know, it, it, in in the uh, in the military, you know, I was in combat action in Vietnam, and uh, one of the you know radio men have like the least life expectancy because uh, you know they'll the, the first thing. Ones. What you want to do is take out the communications tower exactly. or the communic or the radio man. You know, uh, if you control that, you control the perceptions. It's all um, about information. And without communications, everything. yes, absolutely. So, yeah, I when I was an ABC newsman, I was a, a chief engineer for the most powerful FM station on the West Coast. I used to rip off the. Oh, this is back in the 70s, you know, uh, UPI and AP and read that. I had no idea who was wording these uh, press releases and everything. I had no idea that it was controlled at the highest level of the intelligence agencies. You know, my, my small uh, fragment of, of testimony that uh, was that when I was in, uh, in the Navy and communications, I... Um, Back in 1969, was a long time, I was like 20 years old or so, and I was in charge of the code room, Naval Communication Station, San Francisco, and um, we had to use Morse code, you know, do, 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 you know, as a backup, because, you know, sometimes the atmospheric connections, you don't get, you know, the signal coming in. And so a priority message, secret classified, came in from a ship off the coast of Alaska, where the uh, crew was visually witnessing, coming off Port Bow, a 70-foot disc that was glowing reddish-orange and merged out of the ocean and then shot straight up into space. Uh, this was about the time we were supposedly, you know, with on um, the whole moon landing situation. Um, and the radar operator tracked it going over 7,000 miles per hour. Uh, at the time, I couldn't imagine that anybody on Earth 
how this type of technology, I you know, I tried to look in the newspapers, try to see if there was something about it. So it all stuck with me in the back of my mind. You know what? Uh, Sorry to interrupt you, but that message. actually that sounds like Bill Cooper's story when he it sounds like that was the ship he was on when that happened. I I would have to check the dates. But that that was one of his first encounters was seeing something come out of the water and pointing it out to somebody he didn't know if he should or not because he thought he'd be taken as crazy, but somebody else did see it and it took off at a high rate of speed. Now I'm wondering if that's the same situation was the communique you got was from, that would be insane. While I was on submarines, being junior in the Navy, real junior, I had to stand lookout watches. Lookouts are well-trained professional observers. They are not just someone that they grab out of the galley and stick it there with a pair of binoculars. <laughs> you are well-trained because before you yell to the officer of the deck that you got to shoot at something coming at you off the port beam, you got to know that that's really the enemy and not the admiral coming out for a visit. <laughs> And that's really the main reason for it. <laughs> so we were trained observers. Now this is extremely important to me personally because without this experience I probably would not have lent the importance that the later information that I was going to see, I probably would not have realized how important it was while on lookout between the Portland, Seattle area and the Pearl Harbor area, while we were traveling on the surface as port lookout, I saw a craft the size of an aircraft carrier exit the water at a range of approximately two and a half nautical miles off the port quarter. The port quarter is approximately 45 de relative degrees off the port bow. Port is your left. Left port Wine is red, that's where the red light is on a ship. Okay, now we got through that. <laughs> I was stunned. I knew that I had just seen something that was absolutely incredible and nobody in the world would believe that I saw it and nobody else saw it. And I was faced with a dilemma. I'm the port lookout, something just came up out of the water that could destroy us in a second. It was a machine, it was intelligently guided, I knew this. It was as big as an aircraft carrier. It was the most important, earth-shattering thing that had ever happened to me in my life because I saw it, I realized what it was, I knew I wasn't dreaming, there was nobody around who could be manipulating me in any way, shape, or form, and it was my responsibility to report this. Are you kidding? <laughs> I'm going to tell the man who writes my performance report that I just saw this thing come out of the water? you got to be nuts. But I had a responsibility to the safety of the ship, the boat, which we call submarines, boats, not ships, to the boat and to the crew. So I had to devise a method to report this. And what I did was I told the officer of the deck, Ensign Ball, I said, Ensign Ball, I saw something about two and a half nautical miles off the port quarter, but it just flashed and I don't know what it was. Could you please help me scour that area? to see if we can find it again. Now, I didn't really believe that this thing was going to show up again at all. Well, the starboard lookout heard this conversation, and he turned around and started looking too, which he shouldn't have done, because you're never supposed to desert your own field of responsibility, but he did. At about that time, the object came, or this object, or another one just like it, came back down out of the clouds and entered the water. Ensign Ball dropped his binoculars, dropped his jaw, and turned around and just stared at me and didn't say a word. And then he turned back around and he just stared off into space for a couple of minutes. And then he turned around and looked at me again. And he said, this had to happen on my watch. <laughs> He then called the captain to the bridge, which on any naval vessel means that there is an emergency in progress. You do not call the captain to the bridge unless there is an emergency situation, unless his presence is needed. 
If you call the captain of the bridge and his presence is not needed, you are in deep, deep, <laughs> deeper than the submarine will dive to trouble. <laughs> and it's lucky they didn't have submarines in the old Navy when they called people. Now, the captain came to the bridge and so did the chief quartermaster because it was his job to come to the bridge with the captain with a 35 millimeter camera anytime anything like this happened. This event repeated itself several times over a seven to 10 minute period and we watched it. It would exit the water, go and disappear in the clouds and then another ship or the same ship would re-enter the water. We were told by the captain before we left the con, the bridge, not to discuss it with the other crew members, that it was classified top secret, and that we were never to mention it to anyone. Now, the crew knew about it. How they knew about it, I don't know, but I suspect that it was picked up on sonar and radar also, in which case the sonar men and the radar men would know about it too. And I believe that is what has happened, and I believe that they were also told not to talk to anyone. But several crew members came up to me and wanted to know if we really saw a UFO. And I told them uh, that I was not allowed to discuss what happened. Uh, and I didn't know what I saw anyway. So that was the end of that. When we arrived in Pearl Harbor, a officer from the Office of Naval Intelligence came on board and debriefed each one of us independently of the others. I do not know what went on in the debriefings of the other personnel involved, but when I went in, he began to ask me <coughs> what I saw. When I began to describe to him what I saw, he became very upset, even enraged. And having come from a military family, having a father who was an Air Force pilot and an officer, having served four years in the Air Force, I knew what this man wanted to hear it was obvious to me. So I told him what he wanted to hear so that I didn't have to go through with what I knew I would have to go through if I told him anything else. So I told him, sir, I did not see anything. I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, that's the spirit. I had to sign a security oath, I was dismissed, told that I was a good sailor, had a good future with the Navy, and I left. <laughs> On the way out, Seaman Di Girolamo was braced up against the bulkhead in the passageway, and I whispered to him, tell him you didn't say anything. <laughs> and I don't know whether he did or not, because we never talked about it again amongst ourselves. I never finished reading uh, Behold the Pale Horse. I need to go through there and see that instance that you're talking about. But, you know, we know that there's uh, huge, massive underground facilities, uh, you know, that underneath the United States, and I'm sure in Canada as well, oh, yeah. that uh, they, brought over, uh, they brought over the mastermind of uh, the underground complexes in Nazi Germany, Xavier Dorsch, back in uh, 1946 to start in New Mexico, building out these huge underground bases of which, you know, they got maglev trains and everything connecting all these bases. And, uh, and no doubt they have bases under the ocean, both the extraterrestrial and the military, or the joint operations. Uh, because the Soviet intelligence, they, uh, they also see that about more than half of the extraterrestrial craft or ARVs or whatever you want to call them, come out of our oceans. We're mm -hmm. far away from where nobody can see them. It would be fantastic to be able to, to look and see some of these things that uh, people like yourself and even Phil Schneider back to the underground bases, the fact that he came out talking about them, there was 131 of them, he said, in the United States alone at the time of his death that he knew of. And the fact that he was strangled to death with his own catheter, you would have to... And, and, Two plus two in my world, you know, is the, if you, I were a detective, I would have to say that man was, and, and they tried to say it was suicide, that the original cause of death was that he killed himself. Uh, Dr. Carter Tur Turner with uh, some rare cancers and things like that. What do you think about these people in their situations? 
Well, interesting you bring that up. I'm uh, doing, I'm kind of excited. I'm doing an interview with a whistleblower uh, this month on, on KGRA radio. Uh, his name's Emery Smith. I don't know if you've heard of him. I have heard the name. He, uh, he, uh, he was in the Air Force and he was working with medical and he was moonlighting a job and so they brought him in over at the Kirkland Air Force Base uh, working with the private corporations or working with uh, Sandia Labs and Los Alamos and uh, he uh, he worked with about 3,000 different uh, specimens of ex extraterrestrials basically about tw 250 different races he had uh, interacted and worked alongside with extraterrestrials in these underground bases. He's been to the Dulce facility. Um, he's got his DD-214. He's got his paperwork in order to show what, you know, it is He has actual documentation. That's cool. Yeah, like, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, I've, I've studied the, um, you know, I didn't, you know, Stephen, I didn't know a lot about all this when I went to Washington back in 2001. And, you know, after a congressional hearing was denied, I, uh, I knew that Dr. Greer, since we couldn't bring, see, the, the technology they have in the black projects is like so many decades ahead of everything we have now across the board in every area of science. Uh, but there's still a lot of brilliant minds. But ever since that Invention Secrecy Act exactly. back 1951, Basically, the uh, the Nazis, you could say, they infiltrated the uh, the national security apparatus in such a way that the U.S. Patent Office they set up a secret system called the Sensitive Application Warning System. That anybody's got anti gravity, uh, basically anything to get off of nuclear oil and coal or anything, they get slapped one of these national security orders that says you cannot share this with anybody. And there's thousands and thousands of these that will be issued. You know, they go to prison if they try to. And I've I've met with, uh, I spent 10 years, 10 long years, I volunteered um, to, to, we had a database uh, after a congressional hearing was denied, Dr. Greer set up a corporation to try to bring these technologies out from civilian inventors. We had a database of 300 of them. Uh, the first one I went down to, I flew down the Dominican Republic with uh, Professor Ted Loiter who I volunteered because I have a good technical background. And uh, he was a oceanographer you know, uh, with a PhD. Uh, I didn't have any PhDs, but I have a lot of hands-on experience. I worked uh, for 13 years in Naval Electronic Engineering Center on just about everything. So I had a pretty good electronics background. Anyway, we had an energy device that was putting out about 500 watts of power continuously. And uh, was able to demonstrate it. And what happened was uh, when we went to fly back down to document the whole thing, you know, to reproduce it, we were going to send it out by numerous different, uh, you know, DHL, FedEx, you know, different. So in case we get whacked on the way back, you know, several people would have the, uh, you know, the plans. When we got there, the uh, inventor who was a French Canadian, Mohawk Indian, um, <laughs> Very cool. he. Uh, he said that two agents showed up at his door that identified him being a CIA and said that this works, you're dead. And so what he did was he disassembled the whole thing. And so it was a long goose chase after that. But I've met with so many inventors, uh, some of them have been murdered, that had, I've seen the technology work that they've had, but before they got it out. Anyway, it, it's been a control mechanism well, and I don't. I place. think that it is in no way a coincidence that that Invention Secrecy Act came into play shortly after Tesla's death, and they absconded with all of his stuff and figured out all the things that he was inventing. They had to come up with an, impre uh, an invention suppression act just so they could keep that stuff to themselves. They can't have us, like you say, coming up with free energy. They either discredit you, call you a child molester, or kill you. You know, one, one of those things, lock you up or kill you or just flat out discredit you. And I think it had a lot to do with Tesla. And there was somewhere uh, in his biography, he had come up with a, a device and he had sent pieces of it part to Canada, Britain, United States, Germany, and Russia. I'm thinking maybe Germany cracked it first, and maybe that's how they got their electromagnet, along with outside help, 
they were able to crack it first, and that then you end up with your Inventions Secrecy Act. So nobody else is allowed to come out and get rid of the oil monopolies and, and keep us driving gas-guzzling cars and chopping down trees instead of using hemp. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we should be using hemp for a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. um, there is... Um, yeah, there's a situation with uh, with Tesla where he was uh, actually sharing notes with Maria Orsic that they were both born in Croatia, that they you know Tesla knew how to do anti gravity. He shared it with Otis Carr, uh, who was able to make the OTC one. Uh, one of I interviewed one of the uh, pilots, uh, Ralph Ring. Uh, it was interesting that both uh, Maria Orsic's design She's and Tesla's Grill, design correct. both used. That was the Vril Society? From the Vril, right, okay. right, right, which was kind of uh, kick-started the Nazis really back in 1919 when uh, getting ancient Sumerian script from the Nordics, to which they shared with uh, Professor uh, uh, Schumann of the University of Munich, which uh, when he started to look at the, uh, the design, he said, oh my God, there's viable physics in here. And so they started working on it, and that's how... Um, that's how you know they got a, a bit of advancement uh, along with they were working with two extraterrestrial races, working both the reptilian race and the uh, and the Nordic race. And you know the Nazi SS tried to take it over, but the basically the secret societies are uh, in control of the whole thing. But um, anyway, back to, back to some mate, some important elements. The reason why the National Press Club in 2001 happened was because of our legal constitutional government in the United States being denied access ever since 1955 when Eisenhower lost control. Right. And that, uh, and the reason he lost control is that the Nazis did have advanced technology and was able to intimidate them. But there was a split that happened. Um, that if you wind the clock back to 1942, there was uh, what's called the Battle of L.A. Right. Where it had all the anti-aircraft guns going off, and there was about a, about a dozen objects up in the air, and two of them got shot down. There were a drone-type ET craft. I hadn't heard about One that. One got taken. This was a testimony of uh, William Tompkins, who was actually there during that night that it happened. Um and uh, he was heavily involved in the uh, program that was operated out of uh, Naval Air Station San Diego, uh, by uh, oversaw by uh, Admiral uh, Rick Oboda, who was uh, in charge of 29 Navy spies that were embedded into Nazi Germany. So the United States was trying to catch up. They knew they had super advanced technology. And so even the young Navy spy guys were, of course, they were German descent, you know, so they could get, you know, infiltrated in. Um, so they couldn't even believe the stuff that they were saying, you know. And so his job was an information disseminator. He would fly out to corporations, you know, like McDonnell Douglas and Boeing and, and so forth. And everybody was trying to piece this together from what the, you know, the spies were giving for notes and things. You know, and some of the stuff was like, you know, alien cryptic hieroglyphics, you know, really, you know, challenging stuff. So what happened was this whole thing was under the control of Project RAN out of Santa Monica in California, where the Project RAN has been involved with things <laughs> for, uh, for quite some time. What happened was um, both the Army Air Force that grabbed one of these two craft and took it off to Wright-Patterson, the Navy took the other one over to the China Lake to reverse engineer in 1942. Well, 1942, the Nazis had already developed a base on the other side of the moon. <laughs> so they were way ahead of us. What was that movie? Did you see that movie about that? Iron Sky, I think it was called, where the, no, the Nazis yeah. were on the moon and then they come back to try to take over. That was fantastic and, and, and totally believable at this point. And they actually do have a swastika-shaped base that's on the on the moon, you know. So it's funny how they put all the stuff out in fiction and make a joke out of it. We, okay, actually I want to switch gears here. Now, 
there's a lot of talk. A lot of people are saying it's it's fake. Uh, but Stanley Kubrick and the moon landing. Now, I believe it's possible we did go to the moon, but we certainly did not go in anything that we've been shown by NASA, and that was the reason Gus Grissom and Roger uh, Chaffee and White were also... They, they hung that lemon. They had to kill all three of them because Grissom was like, if we can't talk between two buildings, how are we going to talk between here, the Earth and the moon? And... He had to be taken out because of these things. Uh, they even took out, what was this guy's name? Um, NASA spokesman <clears throat> Brian Welsh wound up. He was on shows and he was trying to stick up for the moon landings. I guess he didn't do a good enough job because he was taken out as well. It was uh, Bill Casing. I was watching a show with Bill Casing about. Actually, I did a. It, that's the video that was banned worldwide that I had. It was that video where it's discussing Bill Casing and they talk about how Brian Welsh was murdered for not doing a good enough job covering up for NASA. And uh, I think it, even his daughter, Stanley Kubrick's daughter, came out and was saying, yes, I, I believe my father did do it. He was a paranoid man. He mm -hmm. had good reason to be. He had been threatened. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think about uh, mm -hmm. Stanley and his daughter? And, and uh, Nicole Kidman, yeah. She, uh, Nicole, she I was aware it. that, uh, yeah, uh, you know, she was in uh, movies, you know, like I White, I White Shot That's and true. things like That's that. True. And, and uh, she was aware of uh, that, you know, the the control elements that were in place. Yeah, I have a lot to say on the moon, and I'm, I just wanted to finish off the last thought about the uh, Project RAN. It's an important point. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Project RAN that was kind of overseeing this whole extraterrestrial uh, issue was, you know, being run in secret compartments um, with uh, the Navy and the Air Force. Uh, uh, General Henry Arnold of the Air Force was able to bring in a huge amount of money, and basically the attitude was that you know Air Force takes care of things in the sky, Navy's out there in the ocean, you know, so we should dominate, and we've got the money. So basically, the Navy went and did their own program in secret, and this is a key element that the separation between the two secret space programs currently active right now, that the U.S. Navy has their more advanced than the Air Force. And space why? Program. We'll get back With, to that, but why does the Navy have a space program? Okay, back to what, what you were saying. Uh, Navy has a space program, you know, because the Nazis with the reptilians, basically it sounds like a science fiction movie out of Star Trek, I know, but uh, the Nazis with the reptilians, you know, basically it's kind of the balance, the playing field here, mm -hmm. uh, because what happened was... Um, when when they split, the Air Force tied in with the CIA and the cabal was all involved in that Nazi agreement back in 1955. Right. And so today they're, they're attempting to do a, a limited uh, disclosure because you don't want to expose everything because you mean to show the slave operations going on everything. Where the Navy, on the other hand, like Admiral Tom Wilson said, you know, bring your people before the public. This group's illegal. You know, get this information out. Even William Tompkins, who uh, who met with uh, Admiral Hugh Webster back in uh, 2001, and he said, you know, is this, this information is classified. Can I get all this stuff out? You know, want you to, he spent days with him going over the whole book. Uh, and he said, Bill, tell it all. Don't leave anything out. It's most important to the future of our country, quote unquote. You know, so the Navy has been wanting to get the full, the full story out because they know that it's only with the full story, with the deceptions removed, that the human race on this planet can evolve un unimpeded by this, uh, this, this group. So uh, that's kind of an important element to pay attention to, especially mm -hmm. that the uh, media back in November, remember the uh, USS Nimitz incident where the uh, fighter jet was uh, off the coast of San Diego and they had the Tic Tac, remember? It was I saturated yeah, yes. all over Actually, the media. Right, yeah. It, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't miss it, you know? Even your grandmother knows about it, you know? <laughs>
Did you box moving target? No, I took an auto track. Oh, okay. Oh my gosh, dude. Wow. Look at that. Look at the fly. I mean, everybody, everybody got to see it because every one of the controlled mainstream media outlets, you know, in CNN, BBC, New York Times, you know, political, you know, uh, Washington Post, you know, on and on and on, saturated the media with this. In other words, when they want something to get out, they green light it across the board. So they're, they're seeding the public right now to prep them. You know, just like the movie Pearl Harbor came out just before 9-11, remember? And uh, the new mentor, what we need is a new Pearl Harbor, you know, type of thing, you know? Yeah, so, we can get into uh, Pearl yeah, they, they Harbor, They psychologically too. prep people before disclosing. And I think what Trump is doing with the uh, Space Force that's just recently created is an uh, avenue and we don't need to spend any money on on a secret space program. They've had it developed. The Navy had theirs launched and going by the 1980s. He's forcing so. disclosure. <laughs> yeah, it's like he's trying he, he's trying to get the issue out there. A lot of people were laughing at him, but those are the people who aren't open-minded and don't really the, the people who don't believe in UFOs. The people like us who have at least open-minded enough to go, well, it could be. He, th that was for us. He was like, hey guys, there is a Space Force, I know about it, we're going to make it public by making it a, a branch of the public military now. It, it's genius, in my, in my opinion. It, it, but to see what's going to happen, what kind of technology they're going to show us, because they still want us on oil. They don't want us on the free energy. So it's going to be interesting to see what they put out for us in the general public. Uh, well, the, it's not the public's fault. You know, the public's been duped. Uh, they, all of us have been, you know, for generations. And the fact that it, it, the full truth sounds like the most bizarre science fiction plot you've ever heard, it, it actually keeps its own best secrecy that way. So, you know, people, you know, it, it's easy, the, the giggle factor, you know, it's kind of laugh it off, you know, uh, I feel uncomfortable, uh, it's like, uh, that, that guy can't be real. Exactly, you, know? you feel uncomfortable, it's a program response, that was the perfect way to put it. You start to feel uncomfortable and turn the channel. So yeah, I, keep God, you I, uh, <laughs> I had a good, I had a good, uh, you know, after we met with senators and Congress people up on Capitol Hill, uh, I volunteered uh, with Dr. Greer to travel across the entire United States with uh, the major cities where we rent out big halls. I, I just did the Western United States, you know, uh, Colorado, San Diego, LA, San Francisco, Eugene, Portland, you know, all up and down the whole coast. Without exception, the, the media affiliates they would make fun of it, you know, like in San Diego, they had dancing alien dolls with smoke, and in San Francisco, we heard behind the scenes that they were saying, oh, uh, the disclosure, they were told to make fun of it, so it came out that, oh, the Disclosure Project's looking to aliens to solve the world's energy problems. And then in uh, Portland, I actually have the video clip. I'll have to share it with you. Uh, yeah, I can edit it um, into this show. That would be cool. Yeah, I, yeah I'll, I'll send that to you. Basically, they're, they're saying, uh, they're talking about zero, about the witnesses, hundreds of witnesses, and the zero-point energy, and, and what it means, and the extraterrestrial. And then they all look at each other, the reporters afterward, and they all give a big laugh, and they say, uh, aliens and free energy. Come on, let's get on with the big story. <laughs> the bozos meet the boncos in the playoffs this week, and they go on and like that. You know, it's like you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they're paid to do that. <laughs> they're jingling keys, jingling keys. Look at it. And you know what? You were talking about they, they're, they're the division. If if they don't got you with politics, why you don't follow politics? I bet you follow sports. Whether whether it's basketball, hockey, football, golf. Who's the best player? Who's the best team? They get you get your soccer hooligans. You're fighting over uh, here in Canada. I believe it was about 12 years ago. A hockey dad, minor hockey, just little kids hockey, killed another hockey dad, and, and that's and that's where they're putting all the division into it. They got us. I don't want to say, uh, buy the 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 short and curlies. There we go. Let's put it that way. Um, I also yeah, have one... Yeah, they identify their heart and soul with the whole game. Yeah, that's true. Exactly. <laughs>
Um, yeah, they keep us distracted and occupied and, and at each other, you know, it's like, so we don't start to talk about the stuff that we're talking about, you know. But I'd like to go to the moon with you, okay. um, you know, on, uh, on that subject. Uh, a couple of interesting things with the moon. You know, one of the witnesses uh, was a 20-year NASA employee that she said to me, you know, I don't don a hair. I toured the uh, Capitol building with her, a sweet lady. Good morning, everyone. My name is Donna Hare, and I worked at Philco Ford Aerospace for, from 1967 to 1981. During that time, I was a design illustrator, draftsman. Uh, I did the launch slides and landing slides, and also projecting plotting boards, lunar maps for NASA. And I walked into a photo lab, which was the NASA lab, across the hallway. I had a secret clearance, which is not that high, but I was able to go into restricted areas, which this was. Uh, at the time, I was talking to one of the techs in there, and he drew my attention to a photograph, that a NASA photograph. It had a dot on it, and I said, what is that? Well, he drew my attention to it, and, and I said, is that a, a dot on the emulsion? And he said, and he's smiling, and he has his hands crossed, and he said, uh, round dots on the emulsion don't leave round shadows on the ground. And this was an aerial photograph of the earth, I'm assuming the earth because it had pine trees on it, and the shadows of the craft or whatever it was were in the same angle as the trees. And by its very nature, UFO, and I wanted to clarify that to a gentleman that was talking to me, means unidentified. So I did not know what this was. But I realized at this point that it's very secret, that the, it was kept secret because I asked him, what are you going to do with this piece of information? And he said, we always airbrush these out before we sell them to the public. Uh, another incident, I knew someone in quarantine with the Apollo astronauts. He told me that the Apollo astronauts saw crap on the moon when we landed. And that is what he told me. And he also was afraid, he said, that the astronauts are told to keep this quiet. They're not allowed to talk about it. So I do want to let you know that I worked out there for a number of years, and this I ran into this. So it's not something everyone knows that works out there for a long time. My boss didn't know about it. Uh, some people that sat right next to me didn't know about it. It's, it's very strange because I don't know how they can do it, but they can let some people know about it and then others not. I'm willing to testify before Congress that what I'm saying is true, and uh, thank you very much. Um, she uh, said, I don't know how they do it. You know, I have been there for years, and people don't know what's going on. One person sitting next to you don't have, doesn't have a clue. You know, they're airbrushing the UFOs out before they release them to the public in the pictures, and everybody knows that, that you know, the, the crappy Photoshop jobs that they do on some of that, you know, the blur tool yeah. and whatnot. But uh, the, the astronauts are told to keep secret what happened on the moon. And that, uh, you know, William Tompkins was actually working at the TRW facility in Redondo Beach where they had the live video feed connection and actually saw the uh, large alien spacecraft lined up along the far crater of the moon. And these were very huge, intimidating uh, Draco Reptilian uh, Federation uh, ships that basically told them, you know, pick up a few rocks, do a few missions, because uh, they knew they were, they were obligated to do a few missions, and go home and don't come back, which is what they did. Now, a lot of people say, well, you, you know, you got the Van Allen belt, uh, it, it's known, you can't go through the Van Allen belt, or you, the, well, there's, that's not necessarily true. Uh, they did go to the moon, and the reason I believe that, you know, being a ham radio operator myself right. you know a lot of people do uh moon bounce and things like that when you're operating in uh you know two point some gigahertz frequency it's almost like a flashlight you have to point your antenna very highly directional if they were like flying around in low earth orbit there's no way the ham radio operators who uh, picked up the signal were uh, Buzz Aldrin saying, oh my God, these babies are huge. They're lined up along. And during this time, of course, NASA had a, uh, 
a, a delayed feed. So they cut it off and they said there was a, um, you know, a malfunction of a camera. That's why it happened. But the ham radio operators were picking up the direct signal from the moon. So there's no way if we weren't on the moon that the ham radio operator is going to pick it up plus get that revealed. Uh, so that's a good point. I'm going to have to yeah, check into that. Yeah. Um, you may want to check. Actually, I think you should check out uh, cause you, uh, about the uh, Navy and stuff like that. There's sharkhunters.com you may want to look into. They had, I was telling oh, you. Oh, sure. Good yeah, stuff. you've heard it. So I was telling you about how I tracked the Hess family to Canada. And uh, that's basically how I did it. I was watching, it was one of the guys from sharkhunters.com popped up a picture of this guy, the singer from this band's great great grandfather, and it was the spitting image of him. It was like he was dressed for a movie playing a part in a World War II movie. It was that uncanny. And I was like, wow. And, and that was part of Operation Paperclip. A lot of people didn't realize we got submarines in the deal that were dropped, out. some of them were dropped uh, at Britain, some were dropped here at Canada, and some along the eastern coast of the United States. A lot of people didn't know that. And then Werner von Braun, all of NASA, Nazi NASA, I mean, uh, it was started mm-hmm. by them, so it makes perfect sense, Operation Paperclip. There's a lot of people who say it didn't happen, is my point. It's like, come on, it's proven fact that Werner von Braun was Nazi SS photographic documentation all the proof you need is there so to say that this other stuff is just a conspiracy but yeah it's insane to not think uh with the drake equation and all of that you know you have to believe something is out there and with what we see i see things every night so there has to be something here it's just to me it's a matter are they alien or are they navy you know are that's what i was alluding to do you think it could be the navy the, the good space force that is popping up here and there, letting more and more people see them. Well, you know, I, I don't have any inside information on that, but, you know, the, the whole thing with, you know, uh, Werner von Braun being a Nazi, you know, like they, anybody, I don't trust Wikipedia, but, you know, you can just look up uh, the head of NASA, you know, uh, you know, Dr. DeBus, he was uh, head of Nazi SS in charge of all those operations. And, you know, one of the astronauts, uh, Clark McClellan, actually saw uh, Hans Kammler, who was in charge of him, Heinrich Himmler's uh, SS projects, right. actually sitting there in the office meeting with him. You know, and so, you know, Disney with uh, Von Braun, you know, they were selling the public on, uh, on rocket propulsion when they both knew damn well that they had overcome gravity back in 1934. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, that whole thing was to keep us uh, technologically suppressed. Um, you know, it's you know in the recent uh, release uh, JFK files, which uh, George Bush Sr. Uh, put a 25-year secrecy order on, and which they still haven't released everything, but, you know, in the ones that they did release, it makes it very clear that... Um, you know, Hitler escaped. He was, he was well in, in, in uh, I think it was um, uh, Colombia, and then he moved down to Argentina. Uh, that uh, Heinrich Himmler escaped, uh, the uh, doppelganger that uh, didn't have the, uh, the fencing scar on his cheek, you know, that took the cyanide pill. Right. Of course he would escape. You know, and Heinrich Himmler wanted to have a quote, empire of slaves, you know, which they did in Nazi Germany, and they moved all their operations along with the blessings and consent of the transnational corporations that were actually using slave labor during World War II, um, you know, all down to Antarctica, and then started expanding into, uh, right underneath our feet, uh, to these operations. So, um yeah, it doesn't take too much. You know, the, the trouble is a lot of people, uh, you know, they hear some of the stuff and it just is just too... It, 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 what's happening is they're muddying the waters. You know, a Snowden release, you know, they, they uh, you know, the GCHQ, they've got Sock 
puppets, trolls, shrills. They got these special automated programs that, you know, artificial intelligence that respond to all these people. It looks like different identities. You know, they're they're they've been panicking. You know, like uh, Brzezinski back in 2012, who was the co-founder with Rockefeller of the Trilateral Commission. That's right. That. Uh, he uh, he said there's a fear of this global awakening that's happening. <laughs> you know, they, they're desperately trying to censor and control, since they, they know they control the mainstream media completely. You are fake the, news. Um, the Podesta emails, which uh, Seth Rich paid dearly for, uh, you know, to WikiLeaks, uh, you know, it revealed that they're completely controlling. Of course, the mainstream media never touched on any of the content. You know, where uh, Edgar Mitchell's talking about the extraterrestrial intelligence and the Vatican's awareness of that, oh, and yeah. that the uh, you know releasing the zero point energy uh, devices. You know, so what we have before and is a an entire planet that's been hoodwinked and indoctrinated. On, uh, on a completely false history of what has been going on behind the scenes and the hidden hand that's been manipulating, you know, like from the Bilderberg meetings, you know, uh, you know, to orchestrate their ongoing agendas, uh, which included, as Von Braun's deathbed testimony revealed, they plan to have several false flag, you know, because of the Gulf of Tonkin event, I had to end up going over to Vietnam. Uh, so many guys, in, uh, you know, because of the 9-11 event, you know, had to go Afghanistan, Iraq, and PTSD, and, and the horrible things that not only to our military, based on these lies, but uh, to the civilian population, I mean, millions, of, millions of people are, are getting devastated because of these lies. That, well, the, the infamous uh, Alan Dulles was working with Timothy Leary, you know, to bring the LSD in. They were throwing LSD over the college wall, campus walls, you know, and stuff like that. They want it, but you know, it kind of backfired on them because a lot of people. Uh, got spiritual enlightenment and you know <laughs> it, it, you know expanded yeah. their awareness and so and they thought it was going to you know totally mess them up and some people in some countries I think there was a uh, a place in France or something the CIA did uh, an experiment and it just totally uh, messed people up big yeah, time yeah I believe that's but, the one I was yeah, there's a M MK Ultra is a well known uh, operation that's been uh, uh, created by Alan Dulles of all you the name Alan Dulles will keep coming up again and again and again because he was infamous for the uh, complete infiltration of uh, assisting it and you know there's some indications with um, you know you look at some of the you know I, I base everything I know based on uh, some first-hand experiences I've had uh, with the media and I, you know, I've seen them fly a hundred feet over my head, so I, I know I know it, it's real, it's not something I'm making up. And that uh, I know that there's 500 military intelligence witnesses, of which I'm very familiar with a lot of the testimonies, and I know there's a lot of authenticated, classified documents that substantiate and co corroborate with these testimonies. Mm -hmm. So I use that as my foundational basis. And, you know, it, I mean, there's lots of disinformation out there. And they do want to muddy the waters, so you don't find it. But I always keep going back to that because if, if, if those 500 witnesses, which include admirals, generals, astronauts, if all that's being made up and these documents are all fabricated, then uh, we have an even stranger situation, you know. Exactly, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the things, you know what really gets me? It's, it's the debunkers. The things they come up with are so much more far-fetched and insane than, than the actual facts. Um, you even watch on Larry King... They hit, for a long time his go-to guy was Bill Nye, and you would just see Bill Nye being being trashed. I think it was the Nordstrom incident, uh, uh, Salas. Uh, was it the one? Oh where yeah, yeah. Um, And he was on Robert, with a couple of Captain other Robert people. Robert Salas. My name is Robert Salas. Uh, contrary to what it says on the card, I was not a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. 
I was in the Air Force uh, active duty after I graduated from the Air Force Academy in 1964 until 1971 and separated as a captain. In uh, uh, March of 1967, I was stationed at Malmstrom Air Force Base, Montana uh, as a missile launch officer. I was downstairs 60 feet underground in a capsule uh, monitoring and uh, controlling 10 uh, nuclear tipped Minuteman missiles. Uh, I got a call that morning uh, that they were seeing strange lights flying in the sky. I got another call uh, subsequent to that call and this time it was a more uh, intense tone in the, in the guard's uh, voice. It was very, clearly very frightened. He said there was a, uh, a bright glowing red object hovering outside the front gate. It was oval shaped uh, he had all the other guards out there with their weapons drawn. Both my weapons started going down, uh, one after the other. They went into a no-go condition, what we call no-go condition. They were unlaunchable. Um, <clears throat> we lost uh, somewhere between uh, six and eight weapons that morning. Uh, within minutes of having received that second phone call of uh, a UFO hovering outside the front gate. Uh, we also have documentation. Uh, that I received uh, through FOA requests from the Air Force uh, outlining the, the echo flight incident and including in, in that documentation a reference to UFOs. I'm willing to testify to the truth of all these matters that I've spoken about this in front of Congress under oath. Thank you. He was on Larry King, like you said. Yeah. They brought that goofball scientist with the bow tie. Bill Nye. Uh, was saying, oh, Oh yeah, they, um, they they probably had trouble with the air conditioning system. I was just that, gonna that say time. that. <laughs> yeah, I remember that interview. And the, the only and he said one guy was drunk. That they have they have triple redundancy systems on each missile, and uh, within seconds that UFO flew seventy miles away to uh, uh, Echo Flight, which was the other operation similar, and they all of their missiles, and he brought all of the supporting Office of uh, Special Investigations of the Air Force documentation proving the event, mm -hmm. along with uh, uh, John Callahan. <laughs> My name is John Callahan. I'm a retired FAA employee. I was the division manager for the Accidents Evaluation and Investigation Division in D.C. We let them watch the video. We had all the data there. We had all the printouts that the computer uh, put out. They got all excited over it. When it was all done, the uh, CIA, uh, one of the CIA men told the people they were now sworn to secrecy that this meeting never happened and this event never happened. When I asked them why, uh, uh, I, mean, I thought it was probably just a stealth bomber at the time, he says, well, this is the first time that we have uh, recorded radar data on a UFO, and these guys are going to get all excited uh, drooling over all this data. I said, well, you're going to tell the public about it. And he says, no, we don't tell the public about this. It would uh, panic the public. Uh, I'm prepared to go to Congress, to swear before Congress that everything I've told you people and everything that is here is the truth. Thank you. It's like NASA, you know, it, the, the original lunar tapes of the historic event that, of mankind, oh, it, they lost. They don't know where it's at. You know? And even if they had um, it, they said they don't have the equipment to play it on anymore. <laughs> Oh. Like, like as oh. if they couldn't just have someone make it. I mean, come on, guys. You're trying to tell me we can't remake one of those old-fashioned playing machines that we used to have the technology for? Come on. That's just silly. Yeah. <laughs> it, becomes, it becomes ludicrous after a certain point, you know. But, you know, we have this, uh, this huge canyon, this bridge, you know, that's going on between... The people who are basically sitting back watching CNN or whatever. You are fake news. You know, just, it's so polished and well done. And they're just constantly, you know, with the same uh, same narrative, you know, against Trump and whatever, you know, and the same view, uh, you know, against guns, against, uh, you know, the, the, against the Second Amendment and, you know, whatever. It's, uh, 
but it's done in such a way that they don't once in a while they they slip up and they kind of go over you know like back when the the election between hillary and and uh and trump it's kind of funny oh trump has like a two percent chance of winning you know our polls show the 98 percent you know is, is going to be hillary you know every so often they slip up you know yeah and we know that that was fabricated exactly uh i had pretty much covered everything i wanted to to cover uh, is there anything else you want to get out there like what are you doing uh do you have any conferences coming up i you know i i live off the grid in the mountains and i uh i pretty much a hermit with my wife and i uh I, I it just behooves me to do once in a while a talk show you know like right. yours uh, and it just to you know it's almost like preaching to the choir you know the, the the audience that listens to shows like yours and others you know they're they're pretty savvy you yeah. know they they've done some homework uh, you know once once you start to crack the Pandora's box so to speak of looking into one little piece. And all of a sudden, you substantiate it and find out that that's real. Mm -hmm. Well, then, then how come this happened? And then you ask the next question. Well, how come? And what proof is there behind this? And you keep looking, and you start going in one "oh my god" after another. And you're just like, "Oh my god!" You know, yeah. this is what's been going on. And no wonder the main population doesn't have a clue what's going on because it is so far removed from what we've been from birth. You know, indoctrinated Programmed, with. Yeah that uh, it, it, it's hard for us to wrap our mind around that such a thing could be, you know, as uh, the uh, FBI director, um, J. Edgar Hoover, ah, said, you know, it, it, the American population is handicapped to imagine that such a, uh, such a thing is happening. You know, they, we cannot believe that anything that is could destroy everything that's good and decent could be going on. You know, I, I'm paraphrasing here, you know, mm -hmm. but something is the fact that we're all handicapped to try to imagine the stuff that's been going on behind the scenes and that how our perceptions have been uh, manipulated. The only thing that, you know, I never made a penny at this. I even paid for my own way to go to Washington, uh, Stephen, but I put up a, in 2014, after uh, 10 years of trying to bring an energy solution out, a media company in Hollywood wanted me to write an article on media control being a witness and an ABC newsman. Right. And so I thought, yeah, I want to find out about this. You know, I, I'll take this on. And so uh, I had to do a chronological research back, going back to the uh, beginning of the 20th century, the 1900 to present day and research all the witness testimonies and the documents and try to put it together. Uh, and so I ended up putting it up online at uh, thewebmatrix.net um, and everything's on there. I, I even, um, there's a video of Bob Lazar, you know, that Stanton Friedman says, you know, he, he like, yeah. well, I happen to be, I happened to be at the very first meeting at Bob Lazar went public. Right. It was out, outside of Area 51, and uh, I had a video. It said, no recording devices allowed whatsoever. Well, I, I, I cheated. I had my recorder going on my lap on the front row, and I recorded the two video, two hours of video, which is up on you know, the webmatrix.net. Also, I put together an online fax since uh, you know the members of Congress and things are obviously out of the loop. We had 30,000 faxes go out to the president. I even got uh, a database of uh, foreign embassies around the world, so world leaders all over the place. So all this went out. I told, I was uh, administer because of my technical abilities, I was able to administrate the uh, disclosureproject.org site, and we put this online fax, and I had people send me back the responses, which you can see on the, that website, the web matrix, to uh, see how they respond. Now, this was before 9-11. So it became very clear that the members of Congress are indoctrinated how to respond with official letters of denial from NASA, Project Blue Book, and that sort of thing. So you can imagine if CIA directors, heads of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, presidents are being denied access, you know, the congressmen certainly aren't going to get any. And they usually have cover 
uh, stories that they lead a congressman to that uh, basically says, oh, well, this is what this is, and then it kind of writes it off, and it doesn't really disclose the real project that's behind the projects. And, and this is how they've been able... plausible deniability. Oh, we can't fill you in on everything if, if you were to get caught by the enemy or whatever. Plausible deniability, Mr. President. Was it, that's the line from uh, Independence Day. Why wasn't I told about this? Plausible deniability. Well, that's what Eisenhower did was uh, with Nelson Rockefeller. He got plausible deniability, by, uh, but he then no longer had jurisdiction. And, uh, you know, uh, unintentionally, uh, I think, sold the country out to uh, the biggest mistake to he Nazi made. cabal. Yeah, yeah, he did. <laughs> I remember now what but it was. He really didn't have a choice. No, uh, he, was, he was pushed. Well, he was a military man, too, so he thought... He was being pushed by the military to to set up or finish yeah, when Truman had started, and he didn't. Re and being a military man, he thought it was natural, and it it was apparently he wanted to give that farewell speech a year or two earlier. And it's like, can you imagine if he did? Because nobody was listening to his farewell speech; they were listening to uh, JFK's hello speech. You know, so. But when I first came up, do you remember that morning uh, movie, Good Morning Vietnam? Oh. Good morning, Vietnam! That was when I first got woken up. I, when they had those twins that would sit there censoring the news, striking off all the things he wasn't allowed to say over the radio, I was like, no way, they don't really do that. And so what was that, 1991? I think I was 21 back then when that movie came out. There was a band called Tesla. That's what really, uh, in the 80s, they, they turned out, it's like, what is Tesla? Why would they call, you know, all these bands, Def Leppard, Motley Crue, Tesla. I'm like, what the hell? So when I finally did get a computer, for years, I wouldn't go on YouTube. I refused. My friends were like, dude, get your own channel, blah, blah, blah. F YouTube, you know. Mm -hmm. Finally went on. The first thing I did is I typed in Tesla to look for one of my videos of that band, and up pops a Tesla documentary. So I'm like, oh, that must be where they got it from. So I'm watching it. It's at the part where it's talking about he had a device that was handheld, battery operated, that he had put down and turned on, and it started a little earthquake and started a building uh, shaking, and everybody right, had right, gotten scared right. and stuff. Right while I'm watching that part, there was an earthquake in Washington that was felt, so... I'm feeling my desk and everything starts shaking. I'm like, what the hell is... I, I, I'm not afraid to admit or ashamed to admit. Five drops of pee came out, man. I'm reading about Tesla and his earthquake machine, and an earthquake happened. That's insanity. Yes. You know, there was a, a movie of uh, when Twister come out. We have a drive-in theater here. A t while the movie Twister was playing, a friggin' tornado went through the screen. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> that was here. That. that was that was that was pretty intense. <laughs> yeah, that was here. Yeah, that's where I live. That's where I live. <laughs> yeah. So this is yeah, a Tesla, there's a lot of yeah, paranormal and freak cascading stuff. Cascading oscillations. One built on the. If you're just hitting it on the right, you just you got to hit it on the right. You know, just like hitting a swing. You know, you just yeah. got to keep keep hitting it. I worked with uh, two scientists, well, well actually one, uh, the Bedini brothers who died mysteriously, both of them the same day, uh, <laughs> but he was working on, uh, yeah, I was, he was he's the exact same age I am, I'm like almost 70 now. Um, he, uh, Dude, you look better than I do. With Sorry, I had to interrupt. You look better than I, I. I look 60 for crying out loud. You look like 48. I thought you were like my age. My oh, Lord. oh well. <laughs> no, I'm an old man. <laughs> no, I, I believe in uh, avoiding GMOs and uh, yeah, it helps. you know drinking good water, organic fruits and vegetables. My mother was told by a doctor she was going to die with cancer. They want to remove her eye and half her face. I took her across the border because it's illegal. Mm -hmm. The nutritional therapy. Um, she lived to be 91, cancer free. Awesome. Uh, man who developed the. Uh, the technology, uh, he was strychnine poisoned, and uh, his daughter shared the story with me that the American Cancer Society put his 
death that he uh, died of cancer. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Nazis. Um, you know, look at all the suppression that's been going on with uh, you know all the you know Raymond Royal Rife, uh, you know all all of that all the technology that uh, you know that stuff is just not profitable as those little pills. Exactly. You know, I had a clip on one of my shows, and uh, it's uh, from Family Guy. And the father, uh, the, the rich old guy, Lois's dad, is dying of cancer. And everybody's all afraid. And then the next day, he looks perfectly healthy. And they walk in, and the dog's like, you've got the cure for cancer? Why, why wouldn't you give it to everybody? He's like, there's no money in that. You know, how are you supposed to make money if, uh, off of cancer treatments if the, everybody's cured of cancer? And it's like, hey, thank you, you know, and that's exactly put it on a cartoon so that when people like us say, yeah, there's cancer cures, we get laughed at. Oh, you watch too many cartoons. Yeah, you have to question, you know, the family guy, you know, with uh, every so often they slip out slip out things but the majority of it is like uh, kind of normalizing pedophilia oh, big time. And, and killing and and murder and and and, and spouse abuse and you know it's just kind Why of giving watching. a green light with it you know so it's all this uh, but i think the guys they they slip things in ever so often you know to, to, uh, from the from the white hats and black hats within the media, and you know every even on uh, on CBS, I saw uh, something talking about. Did you know that uh, less than one percent of the population ha owns like eighty percent of the wealth, and you right. know things that you don't normally see. I see through the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. It's rare, mind you, but ever so often you see little little glimpses of truth coming out. Right. Of, of what's actually going on. And that's so they can cover their butts legally and say, oh, no, 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 it did come out. It was on this show at 2 a.m. in the morning while you were asleep, but it was there. It was pu it was broadcast publicly. So we, you know, we're, we're clear and we're innocent and there's nothing you can do to it. It's, it's once again, it's ingenious. They... <laughs> They give us uh, what we want. It, it, uh, for, for the longest time, people were getting really angry with the politicians here in Canada. And what they did to appease the masses was open the bars an hour later, open the beer stores on Sundays. That's when beer store, you couldn't get beer. You guys are lucky you can go to grocery stores and get beer. We still can't do that here. We have to go to a designated beer or liquor store. And they were always closed on Sundays. So to get, and it worked. The liberals, to get our votes, they were like, you can stay at the bar an hour later. Yay! And you, and you can buy beer on Sundays. Yay! And everybody forgot they were mad at them. You know, it worked perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for those who can see. You know, <laughs> but, you know, I think a lot of people are waking up. A lot of people, they, they mess up, you know. They, uh, They're they going too far. They every so often. They're going too far. There was a guy that said, like, Rachel, Rachel Maddow in, in particular. They are going, and, and people like Bill Maher and Jimmy Kimmel, they are just going way too far. And then you get Robert De Niro just comes out, just goes, fuck Trump, drops the mic. Right, right. They want to promote their careers in Hollywood, like Bill Maher, when somebody came in about, talked about 9-11, they said, get him out of here, get him out of here, you know, it's like... But uh, he did try to talk yeah, about you, vaccines. You know what side they're on. Right, well, he, caught, he caught it because he believed the vaccines are causing damage, and he tried to talk about it on his show, uh, Stephen, not Stephen Baldwin, the oldest Baldwin was on there with them, and they started laughing at him and making fun of him. Why are we even talking about this? That's crazy, nutsy, cuckoo talk. And it was like, no, actually, it's a proven fact that he, had, he got pushed down and shut up on his own show talking about vaccinations, and now he's back on the fuck Trump campaign, you know. Yeah, well, you know, people should look up what Pro Project BioShield is. You know, research that. That's something that nobody really knows. But remember right after 9-11, about a week after, it was a big anthrax thing. Right. It actually came from a military bioweapons lab. Yeah, it uh, developed by the military. That, that gave justification. What happens is problem, action, solution, right? They gave justification to start uh, Project BioShield, which is massing these huge amounts of vaccine. 
vaccines. And, and guess where the vaccines were produced? On Heinrich Himmler's bioweapons lab outside of Germany. Uh, they have this huge facility, and that the uh, Supreme Court has ruled that, oh, if you die, by the way, from this in vaccine, the, the pharmaceutical companies are off the hook because of the, the un, uh, how do they put it, the, uh, forget the exact wording, but the uh, unreliable nature of vaccines. And now, recently, we just had a court case where, remember the fellow against Monsanto, uh, because of the uh, glossfates, uh, and the glossfates are in the vaccines. And should that be a case against creating cancer in the, and, you know, and then the governor in California bans it? That the children get vaccinated? Right. Um, it's in your you know, food. It's in, our, it's in everything. So it sets a precedence now. They basically set a precedence for people to be able to sue, at the very least, Bayer. Because now Bayer owns Monsanto. And because Roundup is in everything, right. and this guy won specifically for being exposed to Roundup is what gave him his cancer. And if Everybody on the planet has now got ran, uh, Roundup contamination. Doesn't Bayer owe each and every one of us $294 million? That's the way I'd see it. Yeah, look at history of how these things came about. You know, it was IG Farben that uh, basically was Hitler's biggest financier, you know, with the, the whole Nazi movement. And then at the end, in the doctor's trials of the tribunals that were happening, uh, IG Farben got broken into household names that we knew, Bayer and Rush and all, you know, these, these are different pharmaceutical companies. And uh, William Tompkins, one of the witnesses, said that, you know, besides, you know, going over into the aerospace industry, they infiltrated into the highest levels within the pharmaceutical industries. And the Nazis were all about eugenics. Yeah. And reducing the population. And you think about, you know, the genetically modified food, the fluoride in our water, the geoengineering that's going on with the chemtrails. You've got uh, vaccinations. I mean, Charles Lindbergh was also just, a part of that movement. Charles Lindbergh, I was watching a show on it last night about uh, how he disrupted the police from being able to catch. The person, uh, somebody, somebody went down for it, but that there's suspicion that because he was, uh, his son had some kind of deformity and he didn't want it getting out. Uh, the child wasn't supposed to be killed, died accidentally, but was taken away and was supposed to be put in, in into an institution. That was the, it's, that was the show that's on Netflix. It's called Conspiracies. So I don't, I don't know if you have Netflix or not. But they, they've also, and that's where you find the retarded uh, debunkers that come up with the silly answers and they, they got the look on the face like they're the smartest person in the room while they're coming up with this, just the stupidest answer they could possibly think of. Like Rendlesham Flores, oh, it was a lighthouse. Oh, I, I was there, I saw the lighthouse. Okay, well, don't you think that maybe the guys that protect the nuclear weapons also saw the lighthouse, and that's why they didn't remark uh, about the lighthouse, because, you know, trying to say that Air Force, guys from the Air Force, mistook a lighthouse for a UFO, a landing <laughs> UFO, is just insanity, and that's what happens on this show. Uh, the man who broke that story on the Wendelson Forest was uh, Larry Warren, who was one of the witnesses that, you know, uh, was at the National Press Club that testified that day. And it, it's kind of interesting. You know, they, they hit him over the head with a gun butt and everything. You sign all these papers, you're going to keep it quiet. What, what's interesting is uh, the, um, <laughs> the, the nuclear missiles that weren't supposed to be there, the nuclear weapons in England, uh, the ET craft shone this beam of light down there and reprogrammed them all. You know, so, I had not heard that. It reprogrammed them. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it reprogrammed them, 
And uh, when after we went to National Press Club, you know, a lot of us were on phones and the Hilton and stuff like that. And Larry turned around to me because he was on the phone to the UK because he lives in Liverpool. And he says, hey, Dan, they're they're picketing out in front of Parliament with signs saying expose the secret government, release the extraterrestrial technologies. There was nothing like that in Washington, D.C. Nobody was outside picking or anything. Right. It went over big in England, you know. That's incredible. Okay, you know what? I, I've got an appointment coming up shortly. If you don't mind, uh, we'll get back in touch and we'll make it a two-parter, uh, maybe a week or two or whatever, whenever you're available again after this show comes out. I'll pop it all together, then uh, show it to you. And if you're interested, we'll do a part two and get into some of the other things that we touched on. Because you, you're right, my audience is savvy. But these kind of shows are great for them to show their friends and family. We're talking about documented facts and how they, a lot of people don't realize they're documented facts. So would you be down for doing something like that? Well, for sure, yeah. And all of us are learning. I'm learning. You're learning. You know, there's always somebody Today, has some little yeah. piece that... Oh my God, I didn't know that. And right. So what it does is it makes them look look it up and research it for themselves and find out that it's true. Mm -hmm. And then they say, oh my God, there's another piece is put together for somebody. Right. And that's the only true. reason we do these shows, right? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, I am so glad I reached out to you on Facebook and that you got back to me. Uh, everybody, check Dan out. Dan, wow, what is your website? www.thewebmatrix.net Okay, and you can check him out to see everything he's doing. Do you have a book? No, I don't have any books, CDs. I don't do conferences. I don't make any money on any of this. Yeah, I just, just do a show once in a while just to, just because I got a ticket to talk about it because I was one of the top secret military witnesses right. uh, that testified. So that is, you know, I, I think... You know, there's a lot of people like you and me that are realizing that it feels like time is short. You know, yeah. I didn't have any hope until uh, I understood about what happened with the military, like the, the Navy and the Marines that are surrounding Trump that are working with him. Mm -hmm. And what the, the process at hand is the education of the public and to know that, you know, w w we can't deal with violence. We've got to deal with love. We need to bridge the gap between people. They've all been hoodwinked. Right. We can't use judgment, and, and it just is, perpetuates this whole thing. People need to be educated. You know, shows like yours are helping to educate that and, and, and many others that are attempting to put the dots together so people understand that it's not – we don't have enemies within each other. We have a common – um, I wouldn't say enemy, but an but a, a hidden occult influence that is um, pitting us against each other, and we've got to and and suppressing and technologically hijacking this entire planet. And that's so the stuff we that need I to want become to aware into. of. That. Yeah, I want to delve more into that the, the the next time I talk to you because I believe that the reason we're being bombarded so heavily now you've had to have it's like they're picking up uh, with this 5g and the chemtrails they're hitting us harder and harder it's because oh, people they're don't panicking. realize how strong we actually are between our physical selves and our spiritual beings and our own <clears throat> because we all have an electromagnetic field we i believe in uh we're possible of uh, what do they call it manifest destiny I, I believe in that type of stuff, and that's the kind of thing I want to get into with you. That's the next what time. I'd like to do a show with you, talking about the collective mind we're all connected to, and the morphogenic fields, and how each one of us can affect the reality in the future by according as crazy to as our it sounds, awareness and belief. Right, as crazy as it sounds, I, I, if science you really think about it, yes, yeah, science it. has proven it. it. It has, and maybe we'll even see if we can get Laura Eisenhower in on that one. But uh, for now, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much for taking my call. And uh, you and your lovely wife have a fantastic night. And I'll be in touch with you as soon as this show is edited. We'll, we'll do it again. Yeah. <laughs>